one of the myths that you put in the, I think in yesterday's talk was that regulators from the bank, you know, banking side don't, you know, don't go with FIDA or don't like the idea of FIDA. I'm interested in, you know, interested in that conversation because that is definitely the conversation that I have to have next is, is how do I convince, you know, FDIC, yeah. who is traditionally running all the 2016 guidelines, yes. how do you, you know, how do you get into, you know, how do you make that, how do you make that buy in? Yes. So there's, there's a couple of things here. There's, there's regulators and compliance officers, Ohio. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad. Yourself? Doing fantastic. I mean, you know. We're here at Identiverse 2024, great sessions, great podcasting environment, great guests. Great podcasts. And great lunch. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't eat lunch. Yeah, you yeah. missed out. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had a kind bar for lunch. That's about what I had time for. Uh, as well as our guest, Andrew Shikar, had a kind bar as well. So we're sharing the kindness. Um, Want to give a shout out to RSM and Cyberverse Clients for hooking us up, uh, being able to do this. So shout out to them. Uh, let's get to it. Andrew, this is your seventh time on the show. You're the executive director of the FIDO Alliance. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. Yeah. This is becoming like an annual occurrence where we talk with you at Identiverse and then we talk with you later in the year again around Authenticate Time. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I think those two shows for us at FIDO Alliance are kind of serve as um, two kind of milestones or mileposts, if you will, throughout the years, fall and, and, and spring. Mm -hmm. Um, so we generate a lot of our you know, deliverables around these two events, and you know, it's a good time to engage with the broader identity community. So this is your seventh time on the show. Why is this something that you keep coming back to? Why do you keep subjecting yourself to the torture? Because the hosts are so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so amazing. I, I don't know where to begin. Uh, I'm just trying to no. No, I, 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 first, I do really enjoy talking to the two of you. Um, you know, it's, it's a fun, fun format, and we can be loose and then talk about all things identity. Um, I think the community you've built up has been you know, fantastic. It's been fun to watch the podcast grow. Um, this is a great way to kind of let people know what's new in the land of fight. Yeah, it keeps growing. We've got a, a live studio audience. They're off camera, but they might have questions. They're going. They're also guarding the door to make sure that noisy things try to stay outside. But uh, yes, thank you also to our guests for being here. Um, but yeah, it continues to grow. It's crazy. And you were one of our early supporters coming through. So that also is part of the process, right? Of going through those seven episodes, like that's been spaced out over. When you come in early, you can kind of add your knowledge, <laughs> add my stats. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. It's fantastic. Secret <laughs> strategy. So, Andrew, I mean, Fire Alliance is obviously growing. I mean, your team's growing. From what I hear, the memberships are growing. Give us a little bit of an idea of the kind of growth you've experienced at Fire Alliance. Yeah, I mean, so the Alliance is growing. Um, you know, our, our objective, the growth is not an objective for the Alliance in and of itself. It's really a byproduct of what's happening in the marketplace. Um, our goal as Alliance is to reduce identity-related fraud in the market. Right? And, and most of that comes from passwords, which is why we've been so focused on you know, reducing reliance on passwords in favor of passkeys. Um, and, and our approach to this, we, we've been working on this for over 10 years now. And the, it has been a very mature, robust technology that's being implemented and implemented at scale. And as we introduced the concept of passkeys uh, two years ago, um, you know, things have really just taken off from there. And so what we're seeing is that people are adopting and using the technology at scale. Um, our membership has grown. Um, largely because people want to you know, be involved, right? They want to be involved in understanding <clears throat> how, how are the tech, you know, how are the specifications evolving? Uh, they want to be involved in some of our deployment working groups to you know, understand and establish best practices on how to implement FIDO in different settings. Uh, they want to lead into our you know, user experience stuff. And that's a big growth area for us as UX, as we are not just you know, releasing a you know, real kind of um, watershed uh, U.S. guidelines for the industry to use to make sure that you implement FIDO correctly and PassKey correctly, but also inside that group, we have product leads and design leads who are, again, sharing, you know, learning from each other on what's the best way to, to you know, use this relatively new technology of synced PassKeys. 
so for all those reasons, you know, we are growing as a membership, but also um, our remit is growing, right? So yes, you know, we're focused on user authentication, but we're also looking at the adjacent areas, which matter a lot as well, All right. So one of those is um, in connected devices. So we have a specification called Fido Device Onboard, which is all about you know, onboarding devices and taking the password out of play there as well mm -hmm. for connected devices, such that as soon as they come online to a network, they automatically dial home, if you will, and are immediately onboarded, which is more secure and more efficient than individually you know, configuring each device on a, say, smart meters or for automotive or things like that. And then our certification program can, continues to grow as well. You know, certification to me has always been the thing that makes standards actionable. All right, so our FIDO certified program initially only focused on user authentication products, but it makes sure that if you're you know, a licensing party, that you know these things work together. So you have a FIDO2 server, it'll work with any FIDO certified authenticator because they, we don't just test conformance to the spec, but also that these products work together. So we do interop testing for this. But even that program has grown from the remit of just user authentication certification to we have a standalone biometric performance certification program, and we have new work, new work, work new er work, and identity verification, um, including an announcement we had here at Identiverse, announcing our I, I, uh, face verification uh, certification program that we launched just every bit. So you're verifying people's faces. We're verifying the performance <laughs> of the of the products that are verified face people's faces. So and again, if you're licensing software from someone, um, a lot of this ID work, whether you're doing document authenticity or face verification, has been kind of black box. And the vendor says, oh, I do this really well, and here's my performance numbers, but there's not been a way to independently verify that and certify that. Mm -hmm. And so now with our certification program for the IDV face work, for example, you know that the vendor who's, who's done this has met certain thresholds for, you know, for uh, biometric performance. So meaning like false accept rate, false uh, reject rate, uh, attack detection. Uh, but also the other wrinkle we have in there is uh, bias. Right? So you can't talk about biometric authentication without um, talking about the bias challenge. And so we're testing for bias. You need to see a certain threshold um, to demonstrate that, that your product is not lending to bias in order, in order to be certified. Mm -hmm. So we think this is a really important program and that as companies who are involved in you know, doing you know, more rigorous ID proofing of employees or maybe even of consumers, um, they will want to you know, look for companies that have passed this mark. I think the certification program is, in my mind, a lot of what's needed because FIDO, like Zero Trust, like AI is becoming an adjective. You walk around the vendor hall and talking about it's just dropping a sentence. We're, we're FIDO compliant. And how would you actually know if somebody's FIDO compliant, right? They have a sample approval from the FIDO Alliance. Yes. Makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it could just be, and we're zero trust compliant. Just yeah. believe me. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and so that's why the certified program is so important. And look, we launched had a certified program in 2016. Um, so we have over a thousand you know, user authentication products certified, and I, I love that number. What I love more than that is seeing you know, FIDO product certified being a staple part of more and more RFPs coming out. And so for oh, wow. in, in different deployment scenarios, for workforce, for government, for consumers, you know, so our vendors are getting these RFPs saying you must be FIDO certified, which is great. So that, that, that again, it builds trust in the ecosystem and builds opportunity in the ecosystem. And we have vendors who, you know, of all sorts of innovations. You know, they compete with each other, but you know, all of them have a slightly different lean on things and bring different value to the table. And this allows them to have a common thread of being FIDO certified, which allows them all to you know, um, potentially be used by, by different licensing parties. And I think that, look, I wasn't saying, certainly wasn't trying to criticize people from wanting to be FIDO compliant. It's just what yeah. I wanted to know was, is there any teeth to that? Does it actually have a meaning? I was say, it has to mean something. It has to mean oh, something. Yeah, that's what it means. So to be FIDO certified um, for user authentication products, you, you conform to the specifications. And, and the, most standards have a self conformance test where you say, I conform to this, this spec, and that's great. But we do that so we can they, there's a self conformance test. We, we, we build test tools you use to show that your product adheres to the spec. But on top of that, you're also going through interop testing. So that there's a live test where you must 
test against other products in the value chain to show that these things work together. And ultimately, if I am a, a purchasing company, that's what I, part of what I want. I want to make sure that I'm not being locked into a vendor, but I am being future-proofed. Um, and so when I buy a product, when I license a FIDA certified product, I know that these things are true. So there, there is teeth on it. Yeah, I'm sorry. How many, um, how many uh, products is it by product or by vendor that are certified? Over a thousand products from hundreds of vendors. I don't know the exact number of vendors. Oh, that's fantastic. So each product goes through this verification cycle yeah. process. So like Ubico, for example, has probably you know 25 or maybe more about a certified security. Mm. How do you validate? I guess, remaining in compliance? Is it something where, I mean, we're in a software defined world now, right? Where version update comes out. I can I certainly understand a hardware um, certification, but software certification, is that something out there too? And how do you address so people, that? People need to recertify. Every time. Uh, so there's a recertification process for software products. Okay. Um, and so for like, and that's gonna come more to the fore for this identity verification work that we're doing. You know, there will be recertification every couple of years to make sure that we're still in compliance. So this was announced yesterday. Yes. At, and you, you spoke about this here at Identiverse. I did. What other exciting things are happening at Identiverse that kind of pique your mind as guiding FIDO? I mean, with my FIDO lens on, which is really my only lens, I guess. <laughs> um, I was thrilled to see how much people were talking about passkeys. Mm -hmm. I, I counted 16 sessions that have passkey in the title and dozens more sure they have passkeys in the content. Um, and it's fantastic. Like, you know, we collectively as an alliance and all of our members, I'm talking about thousands of people worldwide have, have been on this journey. And the community is, um, you know, our final community, it truly is a remarkable bunch of people. Um, it's remarkably supportive, collaborative, um, and it's good to see all the efforts that everyone's put into this, being rewarded by um, the realization that the you know, broader identity community has sees what we've built as so integral to what they're looking to deploy. Mm -hmm. So I've been thrilled by that, especially, you know, the, you know, the passkey you know, piece. Two years ago, we introduced passkeys you know, right before an universe. When we came here, and it, was, it was a firestorm and a lot of, a lot of concerns, mm -hmm. you know, because the final security model for the first time was changing slightly or being augmented slightly to allow uh, the private key to leave a device and to be synchronized across the cloud. And um, that, you know, that raised consternation and concern for some people and some skepticism as to whether or not that would ever take root. And so it's been great to see, again, the community kind of keep their heads down and focus on, you know, making sure that our passive ecosystem is open, uh, inclusive, uh, and then working just to you know, focus on the benefits of, of how this can be used. And then you're seeing these massive rollouts that keep on coming every week. There's someone new rolling out pass keys. Mm -hmm. So today I was on stage um, with Amazon. So Mike Slaw joined me on stage and talked about how they have tens of millions of Amazon customers enrolled in pass keys. Tens of millions, right? And then um, one of their success metrics is over a 15% increase in sign and success rate. The Amazon runs like a 1% margin, I think. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, in, if you're increasing <laughs> sign and success rate by 1%, I think that's gonna move the needle on their bottom line. 15% it has to be making meaningful impact to, uh, to, to their margins and to their bottom line, which is great. And that success rate really is talking about people who can't get logged in, they need support or they need yeah, so say, faster, faster exactly. way to get in, right? Exactly. And, and like, so I mean, it's not to say that the 15% of like the people who yeah. were not getting that well, so they say the number of uh, signs, say the sign of success rate hypothetically, just, this is not their number. Say with passwords is 75% and then with pass keys is 90%. You know, that 25% of people with passwords not getting in before, a lot of them would go through a reset and get, mm -hmm. you know, get signed in, um, but some of them probably wouldn't, and they'd leave. Yeah. You know, so that's a, that's a very meaningful number. But we're seeing that number time and time again for people who are sharing data on how passes are working. And the two metrics, two most common metrics, one is success rate and time to sign in. Hmm. And oftentimes being compared to legacy 2FA, like SMS OTP. And in both instances, you know, both numbers are, are, are improving. And so I mentioned that there's always someone new you know, coming in, you know, rolling out, like I was thrilled to see Amazon, I was thrilled to see PlayStation and Microsoft. And um, I was staying in the hallway, someone from a major online service just came up to me and said, hey, I love your talk. And in a couple of weeks, we're gonna be rolling this out to 20 million consumers. So, you know, so it's the proof's in the pudding. Mm -hmm. um, 
again, the work and the focus that everyone in the alliance has put into, into you know, building the core foundations of FIDO authentication, developing the use cases and the best practices for how to do this. You know, the UX work we're doing, which really paints a picture on how to drive and optimize enrollment flow for passkeys and management flow for passkeys. All those things are leading to the success that we're seeing in market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the coolest thing I've seen is all of that, which is the fruits of the labor that everyone's put into uh, the work that Fido Alliance has done. Yeah, you actually just stole my, my, my next question, which was going to be, but I've seen Col uh, Kevin Goldman around at the conference this year. Yeah. To me, it's like, if the user experience isn't good, then the whole thing kind of sits on a weak foundation, but the user experience, like you guys have put so much effort and investment into that. You know, Cameron's been transformational and, and the work that group has done has been transformational. And um, it's it really cool to see. So that, that they had a master, they did not have a master class, take it back. They had a 30 minute session and they introduced the guidelines. It, it should have been a master class, I'm not complaining, but it should have been because <laughs> it was overflowing. And they had 25 minutes to talk about the guidelines. Um, there's a lot of documentation. To this. There's a lot of documentation on it that. Is, it is so deep. Yeah. So I'd encourage people to go to our site, phytoalliance.org slash UX guidelines. I'll get the link and I'll put it in our show. Or just search Fido UX <laughs> guidelines. They have you know, pretty good search stuff. Um, but the depth of content there is amazing. And this and, and, and what's been really cool about that group is that for you know, those standards geeks who are listening to this, you understand how standards work, you get standards work. You get a bunch of really bright people in a room to, you know, who are experts in their field to talk about protocols mm -hmm. and argue about like where semicolons fit and that you know shall versus musts. Um, we have the same practice here with UX, but instead of you know engineers, we have designers and messaging experts and UX leads and human interface leads, and they've all collaborated like remarkably to scope the research that has led to our guidelines and to refine the guidelines and actually develop a UI kit, which is freely available too. So mm -hmm. the resources that this brain trust has put into the UX work that we have, the de design work that we have is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all, it's, it's an incredible resource for people to use. And one thing I find gratifying, I know that the UX group finds gratifying is when I talk to someone who's deployed and said, yeah, of course I use your guidelines. Um, and it's super helpful. So yeah, we, we feel really good about that work too. And it's free. It's on the web. It's not like it's gated behind anything, right? I think people can get it's to it. It's all free. Yeah. It's I mean, all free. Like we're, there's no reason not to use it. There's no business interest. Right? And, and so we will be expanding. That's one of our key themes as an alliance is enablement. You know, what can we do, what can we do to enable people? Mm -hmm. um, so whether it's you know, usability pieces or um, other assets that we will be developing and, and, and rolling out over the next couple of months, it's all about helping people get to yes um, and get to deploy. But coming back to your key point, Jimmy, usability is key. Um, and I've said this for years, like if your MFA is unusable, well, it won't get used. Um, so your consumers won't opt in and employees will work around it. Um, but what we heard today in the, the session that I did is that both sides of the equation are super important. Right? Our, our tagline is simpler, stronger authentication. So yes, it needs to be simple, but it needs to be strong too. So Bank of America talked about why they came to FIDO's purely from a security standpoint. You know, they want to stop the threat of social engineering that imposed hundreds of thousands of employees around the world, which they've done by rolling out FIDO. You know, throughout the organization, 97% of their employees are not using passwords, they're using different forms of FIDO authentication. That's fantastic. Which means that security threat has been thwarted. Yeah, this might seem like a down in the weeds question, but I, I think one of the things when we have MFA, but not FIDO yet, or, you know, not in the form that it's in now, so we could say MFA on, you must use MFA. Can you do the same thing with pass keys? Can you make it? Because every time I kind of go through through the flow with, you know, more and more, you're seeing pass keys more and more, it's always, do you want to use this instead of passwords? And I kind of think that's because some people don't want to change, period. They'd rather take the risk of passwords. But if I want to make pass keys required, is that, and is that too down in the weeds of a question? No, I'll try, it says, tell me if I get off track of my answer, and that'll be an answer to your question if that's too in the weeds. Um, no, I, I think that, I mean, a couple things there. 
you know, one thing you'll hear me say a lot is that we need to reframe the way we think about authentication. And the only fair reference anyone's ever had on authentication is how to make passwords suck less. Right? Passwords are horrible. Everyone knows they're, everyone knows they're horrible. So we add on layers. We do MFA. And that's when the answer is add on layer. And all our regulations, you know, most regulations to, to date have been about how to do MFA. And they never contemplated a true password replacement. And passkeys are that. Right? So uh, we have a question that I asked. Any questions? Yeah, come on up to the microphone. So I guess I do have that's you're heading down that path with Bank of America that I talked to this morning, and then I think it was your comp your talk yesterday. Yeah. The the one of the myths that you put in, I think, in yesterday's talk was that regulators from the banks, you know, banking side don't you know, don't go with FIDO or don't like the you know, FIDO. I'm interested in you know interested in that conversation because that is definitely the conversation that I have to have next. Is, is how do I convince you know FDIC, yeah. who is traditionally running all the 2016 guidelines? Yeah. <laughs> How do you, you know, how do you get it? You know, how do you make that? How do you make that buy? -in? Yes. So there's there's a couple of things here. There's there's regulators and compliance officers. Oh my. Um, so I mentioned regulations. Um, so when I introduced passkeys two years ago, there's a lot of pushback. Like, well, this is different. This is scary. This is like people aren't going to buy it. Regulators are going to hate it. There's no regulations. My point of talking about the frame of reference is that. Any regulations on the books today were developed thinking about how to make prevent the damage of passwords. But now there's pass keys as a password alternative. And so in this supplemental guidance 863 B, I think was a, a good step in that direction, which recognized basically said that if you implement sync credentials or sync pass keys, according to their guidance, that it meets AL2 and can be considered unofficial. Um, and then CISA has their own, came up with their own statement talking about using sync pass keys as, as, a, you know, as a form of 2FA. All right, so I mean, full stop, I think, you know, pass key is gonna be as effective or more, or I'd say more effective than SMS OTP, the legacy form of 2FA. Now, for super high assurance scenarios, um, you'll wanna use a device bound pass key. Uh, but you know, there's, there's wrinkles in all this stuff, right? So I think, going back to your question, like how, how do we talk, to, so a couple of things. So, I think the NIST guidance is going to be a really important milestone, and we'll see other regulators start to follow suit. And we have a very active policy engagement program where we engage with policymakers worldwide. We'll point them to this; they're aware of this, and I think that as they're updating their own guidelines and guidance and regulations in countries all over the world, that they'll start following suit and start thinking about well, if you're using passkeys in this, if you're using passwords, then you must do traditional MFA. So I think these things can coexist. I think guidance will come out that points to um, points to passkey specifically. Now, going as far as banking goes and regulated industry, you know, the question remains: Well, how am I going to, you know, how do I roll a sync passkey to consumers when I don't know about the provenance of the, the passkey provider? Or I don't even know for sure that's Andrew on that device because it's synced. You know, these are legitimate questions too. And so, my answer there is a couple fold. One, um, you know. Every platform provider who's you know, active inside of Fido Alliance is deeply committed to addressing high assurance scenarios with sync pass keys. Right? So that will happen. It's a matter of how we get there, what the technical solution is, and when they choose to support that in their platforms. Um, but a lot of banks I'm talking to today, even with that understanding, uh, with that challenge, if they don't necessarily have all they want, you know, they're choosing not to let the perfect get in the way of the good and going back to their compliance officers and saying, well, geez, even if I use a, a passkey as a password equivalent, if I just treat them one for one, I want a much better place taking a passkey as a primary factor than I was with password as a primary factor. So it might be initially, as we see banks rolling out passkeys you know, cautiously, maybe they start with passkeys just for signing. And then maybe they do some sort of setup for you know, higher value transactions. Or if you think about this, at the end of the day, these are all signals. Right. Everyone has a risk engine, and, and, and then these are all different types of signals that they have. And so, if you lean more under other signals, and you lean under passkey signals for now, but as a, the passkey itself has more and more trust signals embedded in it, you could dial down other signals. I don't think that any regulated entity would ever trust a passkey in them itself. But they wouldn't trade any. They wouldn't trust any other single, you know, authentication credential without doing added risk, you know, risk modeling and things like that. So. Um, 
Thank yeah, you. I think the we're super happy with the, the the supplemental guidance from NIST. I think that will help accelerate and control um, more cautious entities and to start to support passkeys for their consumers as well. Do you think situations like the FIDO certification helps that case made to say, are there, are there other organizations waiting for that to be in place to say, okay, there's a little more assurance that. So, that so one thing we want to do is, so the program we have in the books is a certified passkey provider program. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a legitimate concern from, from some entities. Like how do I know that the person managing these passkeys is, how do I know their business is good? All right, so maybe it's, okay, I'm, I, I'll, I'll trust Apple and Google if they're known <laughs> entities and I trust their security, but if, if Joe's Paskey provider is managing Andrew's Paskey, why would I accept that? Mm -hmm. And so the program we're, we're putting in place is a certified Paskey provider program, which will certify that the manager of these Paskeys is you know, taking the requisite steps to protect their cloud, you know, in, in, encrypt cloud, protect the keys and all those things, such that once certified that the relying party would should have more confidence in that Paskey provider. So I think that's something that, that's something from a certification front that we intend to deliver, which could help. Um, so, yeah. I'm sorry, let me interrupt right there on the uh, <clears throat> certification. Who would conduct the certification? How, what do you, how do you foresee the mechanics of something like that? Because that sounds pretty involved. Yeah, so we, look, we have a very robust certification program. Um, we may have certain certifications in-house and some with third-party labs. And so typically we talked about how uh, user authentication certification works where you do self-conformance testing, we verify that, and then we do an interop test. On top of that, actually, we have secretariats. who will do a vendor questionnaire to, to do a further rigor on the vendor itself to make sure that everything's up to snuff. Um, so for the certified passkey provider program, it'd be you know, more of that piece where we are assessing this, like there, there's a vendor questionnaire, there will be some conformance, like some, some physical tests also, uh, the authenticator tests on, on, on how they're actually performing. Now, those are all things that we can manage in-house. Now, where our certification gets more complex is with biometrics, where you know, there are third-party labs. So the biometric testing is incredibly complex, incredibly expensive to set up. And so we work with third-party labs to do, um, to do, do those tests. And so we, we do these in conjunction with third-party labs and Typically, the vendor will come to us with their vendor statement. They then work with the lab to go through the test for whatever they are testing. They come back to us for the certification and the management of that certification there. Well, that just kind of shows the value of being certified in spending all that money to go to a lab and do all these things. It must be pretty important. Yeah, and I, I think ultimately, you know, certifications are driven by two things. Um, the most important one is, well, one is customer demand. Um, you know, customers want to see certification, especially again in, in regulated industry, they compliance is key. And so if it's like they want to be able to go to the compliance officers and say, oh, look, this is FIDO biometric certified or IDV certified, whatever it is, like, that's very important to have any certification. Um, of course, you know, the rigor of the certification is, is important, but having that certification is critical. So the customer demand for certification is, is one component. The other thing is, you know, as I said, we have thousands something FIDO certified products, and we have hundreds of vendors who are in the FIDO community. That yeah, certification could be an area of differentiation as well. All right. So for our, 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 our authenticators, hardware authenticators, we actually have higher levels of cert security certification they can do, um, like L1, L2, L3. And so we see companies going through that both in response to demand, but also in able to differentiate themselves from their competition. I think we had another question here. Yeah, and you're Robert Peller with Tyson Foods. Uh, yesterday, uh, the CEO of Ping started out with a deep fake video. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how does the FIDO Alliance, Alliance's face verification addressing uh, being able to prevent deep fakes like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, the evil Andres. There's <laughs> two evil Andres. <laughs> evil Andres. I love that. Um, so, part of what the uh, certification IDV certification, the face verification certification program does, uh, is look at liveness. Um, so on the, those videos were, were not great liveness, but they kind of showed how they could be manipulated. But beyond that, there's things that the vendors are checking for that are a lot more subtle, um, like shadowing, 
Um, they could flash a bright light or something like that, at, you know, to look for a reflection on the face. There's all sorts of things that they do that frankly I don't fully understand <laughs> um, that the vendors do and that we test for also to ensure liveness. So liveness is more than just, you know, moving your head or saying a catchphrase. Although those are, those are also really important um, elements of liveness detection as well. Mm. Yeah, I'm not a robot. Yeah, this is exactly what a robot would say. <laughs> <laughs> so Authenticate is coming up later this year. We're looking forward to seeing you again yeah. in Carlsbad. Yes. Beautiful. What can we? Yeah. What can we expect for for folks who haven't been to Authenticate? One, it's awesome. Yes. But tell people why they should be there, other than to see us and you. Yeah, well, that's well, that's that's probably a reason not to come. <laughs> uh, not me, no, but that's a reason to come, of course, is to see us. But it's um, look, if you want to lean into learning more about authentication and Fido, this is the place to go. Um, I love Identiverse. You know, I love the, the broader identity community and, and this is a great place to learn. And, and a lot of the, like Identiverse Authenticate, the sessions are fantastic, but the hallway con is, is even, even better. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned before about our, our community, now I've been involved in a number of standards and I've never been involved in a standard where people really generally want to help each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, they want to help each other and they want to help new entrants and people who are new to this. They want to help everyone be successful. Um, and that's what happens on Authenticate. It sounds, it sounds so cheesy, and, but it, it really is a remarkably warm, um, encouraging and supportive community. And, and I think you see that you guys have been in the past couple of years. You see that in spades of Authenticate. Um, but I, I, I had co companies who um, I know who have deployed, they always say to me like, so I often time connect them with someone else who has successfully implemented FIDO and they kind of want to pass it on. Mm -hmm. um, and so people are always willing to, what's the term? Um, collaborate? No, it's not collaborate. <laughs> There's a movie called whatever, they like pass it on or something. Um, but that mean now, I don't know. Anyway, people are willing to. Uh, <laughs> There's a movie, somebody, I'm sure somebody in someone the comments like, it's this. It wasn't a great movie, <laughs> um, but it was, it was the whole idea of like, you spread the wealth. Mm -hmm. And so there's this willingness to, help each other kind of bootstrap, uh, bootstrap your own knowledge and, and, and get engaged. So that's a long-winded way of saying it's a great place to learn. Um, it's also fantastic. Pay it forward. So pay it forward. Thank there you. we go. Jim, Jim to the rescue. Uh, pay it forward. So people like to pay it forward. And they, like, the individual actually said this to you, I'd like to pay it forward. Please connect me with someone who has the same use case as me. But that's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. but you don't see that with other standards. You know? So I think that speaks to a couple of things. And I'll come back to authenticate in a second. But I think that spirit of community speaks to the magnitude of the mission that we have and the challenge at hand. Like no one's ever said, yeah, you guys are just like, why get rid of passwords? You're so awesome. <laughs> like everyone understands the challenge. Said so nobody ever. Said no one ever. <laughs> yeah. you know, so, and there's a sense of, you know, this collective, you know, the collective will is the only way to make this happen, which also speaks to the fact why we have so many of the, the right companies sitting together doing this. So Apple, Google, Microsoft, but like, that's pretty cool. Um, but then the next layer down, like fierce competitors all working side by side, to make this happen. Yeah. So I think the magnitude of the task at hand leads to the, the spirit of collaboration that we have, which is also uh, manifested at Authenticate. Um, Authenticate itself is in Carlsbad, California, which is beautiful for anyone who's not uh, living in Southern climes in October. I'd recommend coming early. Um, it's actually, for some, it's a holiday weekend, um, but you can certainly come out and enjoy the, the setting at the resort. There will be some activities on even starting as early as Sunday. Um, kicking off Monday afternoon, we'll have great social activities. Um, it's just a, a really fun time and a fun, fun place to learn about all things by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to see the three of us. Oh, of course, yeah. I could definitely vouch for the weather. In fact, when you say it's a warm environment, I see, yeah, San Diego is warm, especially compared to Seattle, where it used to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I got a big kick out of it, you know, last because last year was our first year in that, that, that venue. And frankly, I wasn't sure I was going to go, but what made me so happy was walking around and seeing what I was calling a bunch of authenticators. Mm -hmm. you know, all the authenticated attendees mm -hmm. like sitting like in the little groups like throughout the resort. Like, you know, there's, there's all these cool places to hang out and like be in the sun, enjoy the yeah. outdoors in between sessions and just getting to know each other and, and, and comparing notes. And so it's really, it's a really cool environment. There's a word that comes to mind and I was thinking about this the other day and I was kind of describing the authenticate conference to someone else encouraged them to come out and it was the word fellowship. Yes. It's yeah. very much a community and I think a lot of people in the identity community really start to recognize this. You're here at Identiverse yeah. and it's it's almost like a high school reunion every yes. year, right? You're seeing the same faces and the names of, hey, how you doing? And maybe you don't know each other's names yet, but you start to recognize the same people. It's, right? 
It's very similar to that. Mm -hmm. And, and we, to be clear, we, we um, had a nice collaboration with that Edinburgh team on this as well. So mm -hmm. when we first came up with the idea of authenticating, the first people I talked to were Andre and Andy. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to make it very clear, we want this to be complementary to what's happening at Edinburgh, be part of that community. So we have a really nice working relationship with this conference and now mm -hmm. CRA as well. So I, I think it really does help continue the conversations that are happening there, you know, six months down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, tagging on to what you're talking about, seeing old phase high school reunion, making new friends. A couple of our friends here are from Tyson Foods, and we're talking about before we start hit record. Uh, we're talking about you know the different types of work environments that exist. They've got a plant with like where they speak forty different languages within one plant, um, and so that gets me to thinking about these different scenarios I've run into over time, like clean rooms. And one of the odd ones I remember was like a prison. You can't bring your phone yeah. into a prison, <laughs> right? So how do you manage that from an authenticator standpoint? Um, and that's why there has to be this wide variety. And I wouldn't say Fighter Alliance is a platform, it's a standard, right? Yeah. But it allows companies to go out and innovate in that area, come up with an authenticator that meets a need that others don't. And one of the coolest ones that I run into, so here goes the question. Oh. <laughs> the, the cool thing that I ran into was um, an authenticator that used your brain waves through your ear. So you'd wear some kind of headphone. How setup. deep in your ear? <laughs> <sighs> I don't know the answer to that, but it it's must like a somehow fiction movie. pick up on brain waves. And I guess they're like an individual signature. I thought that was like innovative. I wasn't sure what the use case would be, but then I heard about other different ones like bracelets and yeah. things mm -hmm. like that. I'm wondering, Andrew, what authentic bio authenticator have you run into that really rings a bell? It's like, wow, that's something different. So yes, yeah, so we don't we don't specify biometric modalities, um, but like they, like early on there, someone had a bracelet that looked at like your your, your pulse, um, which I believe is different for everybody. Wow. Um, so pulse, um, temperature, like things like that. There's all sorts of, and I'm not an expert in biometrics, but there's all sorts of things that you can pick up on. And I think it, but, but since we don't specify modalities, it, it allows for this innovation mm -hmm. in the informed factors um, for different use cases. And so, you know, I think there's a lot out there. If someone brings something totally new and off the wall, they have a kind of process for making sure that this actually can be quantified. Um, but generally, it's, it's, it's pretty open book for people to innovate on top of. But some of the scenarios you're talking about, the OT or in the prisons or things like that, these are real scenarios too. Look, mm -hmm. NCCOE, which is an effort out of NIST, a couple of years ago did something for first responders and, and they liked, you know, FIDO having multiple modalities because, you know, if you are a first responder and you have gloves on, you can use your mm -hmm. gloves, well, you can use a finger grip, but you can use your iris. Um, so like you, there's certain scenarios where you need to have other, you know, various modalities yeah. to be available for, for signing. I think that's so cool that like there's a standard out there and it enables innovation to build around the standard, yeah. build your own business around kind of like this innovation that you come up with that solves certain use cases. Yeah. Another question from the audience. Come on up. <clears throat> It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sarah Roberts also has some students. Um, to us, some of the, uh, some of the challenges I think to adding Fido keys into the environment is this other device that's, that's being added. You talk about adding layers to passwords or just adding more layers of devices that people have to carry with them. Is there any efforts to be added to, let's embed them into wearables, things people already have and that can now become the authentication factor instead of, oh, here's another key in your company and a key for this company. Yeah, we have to have all the seeds. There are efforts into helping simplify that. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I think um, so. Yes, you know, I think in general, if you're looking at your workforce, redundancy might be a good strategy to have. Right. So you give someone a security key. They can also use your, if your Windows shop use Windows Hello. Some of the functionality built into like Windows Hello for business stuff like that. In addition to security key, we have a lot of companies now offering these these uh, mixed use badges. So your badge gets you in the door is also your badge that signs you into your computer. So you're not necessarily adding something else in. Um, you could also use your devices, security key, dog lesser rings, like there are wearables. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, for the workforce setting, a lot of this comes down to uh, policy and permissions. Uh, but there certainly are ways to 
to manage this. But you know, in the workforce, the best practice is to have, or if you're using security keys, to have two. You should always have two security keys in case you lose one. So have one on you, one in a safe place. Um, that's also part of where Cassie is going, like Sync Pass is going to play. In the sense that it synchronizes that, but you, you have, you know, again, lower lower assurance associated with that, but more redundancy. Mm -hmm. And the choice is good, right? You we need to have choices to be able to address different parts of the market and people yeah. and you know accessibility, right, and all that stuff. So yeah. even the brainwave stuff, which I kind of joked about. It, you know, there's, you know, the Neuralink patient, right, is doing amazing things with that technology. Yeah. Like, there's a use case for something like that. There is. And, and, and everyone's like, especially talk about the enterprise, like, come, like Tyson's a huge company. <laughs> um, Shane Wheaton from IBM is giving a talk tomorrow about IBM going path through this. And, you know, and they support a range of things from, from sync pass keys to security keys to uh, Windows Low and you know, apps and things like that. So I think, and even Sean's aides for BMA talking about it. We didn't get into details on, on what they're doing, but I know they have a blend of apps and keys and badges. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the idea is kind of meet, meet your users where they are as much as you can, or let them use, you know, so long as it stays in compliance with your own corporate uh, requirements, you know, try to meet them where they are with a better chance of them actually using it and then and, and de-risking. The whole goal here is from the workforce standpoint, or a goal is take, get rid of risk. And, um, and you better security with better usability. Mm -hmm. So meeting them where they are, that's really important. That's a good question. Yeah. Thanks guys for, for coming up and stepping up to the mic for sure. Um, we're gonna wrap things up here. Um, you know, we end on a lighter note. Yeah. So I wanna ask you a question that I've been dying to ask you for a long time. Usually you give me these in advance. I do, but not today. Not today. Yeah. What's your favorite song by the band Heart? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is a callback. You have to go back to listen to episode one yeah, if you want to do that. Time. Right, exactly. Um, no, but what's been the most memorable Identiverse experience for you this year? Is there something that sticks out? Um, uh, no, the whole show has been, it's been a blur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just a memory. I'll have to think back on memories as I get a chance. To this is why it's a, at the end, it's kind of like a gut reaction, visceral type of I'll thing. I'll one of my favorite things was sitting in Andrew Cameron's talk about the GM, and, and Andrew gives a talk every year about how GM does identity. Mm -hmm. But he mentioned pass keys, like, of course we're doing pass keys. Yeah, like it's, of course, of like course. what do you mean? Like table stakes. <laughs> right. And to me, like, for someone like Andrew to say something like that, it was, 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 it was really cool to see that, mm -hmm. where it's become table stakes, uh, or become an expectation. So that, that, that actually, that was, that was a, one of the first sessions I sat in, if not the first one I sat in, mm -hmm. and was a very early thrill for me. I mean, inside you're like, yes. Yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> and again, it comes back to, um, you know, people have worked so hard inside the lines. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, again, there's so much passion and so much dedication. And so to see all that work um, transferred into people using the outputs of, of all that labor is just, just, just extremely rewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fantastic fantastic alliance the people in it are top notch we've been following it for the last couple of years right as part of the podcast and to see to see the adoption go from we think this might work to oh my gosh it's working <laughs> right to <laughs> oh my gosh, gosh, it. Doing it. <laughs> yeah exactly and it becomes the of course yeah, yeah. it's like no brainer type stuff no, that's great yeah. so we're, we're happy oh, there's still work to be done mm -hmm. right there's still you know, there's always room to improve and, and, and I mean, there's work to be done, a lot of work to be done, but like I, I, I say, you know, we're making pass keys inevitable. I, I firmly believe that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're committed to making that happen. Excellent. Should we wrap up or do you have one? Yeah, something? no, I've got, I don't have something, but I wondered, I just had a question bubble up in my mind. Do you guys have your naysayers? Yeah. But not like, hey, we think passwords are, well, there are those two. <laughs> That's a big password for you. <laughs> people, like, people like passwords, mm. right? Any survey you do with consumers, around 30% of them say, I got this password thing nailed. I have a, yeah. great, I have a great formula. You know, you're going to pry my passwords from my you know, cold fished hands. <laughs> yeah. um, so those, there's those naysayers, but people like, um, naysayers about what FIDO licenses do, not, not so much. Well, there's some consternation around, again, the syncing of the private key and what that meant from a, from a uh, security posture. But again, I think that's just a, you know something we're going we're to work through and improve upon. It's, it's interesting. I was talking to some people this week. You know, if the, if the FIBO story, the WebAuthn story, if the arc began two years ago when we introduced 
capacities. Mm -hmm. We started there, but yeah, of course, by default, they sync. And that was the expectation. You know, the thing about consumerized IT, things generally start simple and get more complex. So this all started two years ago. People will be thrilled there wouldn't be any consternation at all. But there's a prehistory to this, of course, which is all the great work we did with 502 beforehand, go off in, where you, you had some of those, you know, a little more assurance and, and, and more details on, on the device and on the user. So it's that prehistory that um, people want to get back to. That's understandable. Wow. Right? And, and we'll get there. Again, again, there's deep commitment to fully supporting those high assurance scenarios um, you know, by the platforms and by the passkey providers, and we will get there. And so, again, any naysayers are more about like that, like that. So that frustration that we had this, you know, in, in their mind, perfect scenario for product from a security standpoint. But ultimately, what we saw was that that was not the perfect scenario from a usability standpoint. Right? And, and, and the, the data proves that out. Right? We talk about 13 billion accounts being capable to use fast keys. That would not have happened if we never changed this model. Yeah. And our goal is to reduce reliance on passwords at planet scale. And so it simply is not possible without allowing this key to be more readily available. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I'm going to give you a shout out. My great, my most memorable moment was, <laughs> it's not a moment really, but I was just so impressed with the panel that you hosted. Yeah. I think it was a microcosm of what the various sessions were like here, right? You got into kind of that level of detail and people were geeking out and talking about this Kate, Kate protocol. Continuous access evaluation protocol. And what I thought was so cool is like the level of geeking out and the room was pretty packed. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, microcosm of what's going on. I think advice out there for folks who are considering this conference next year is, you know, you can go anywhere from engineer level all the way up to business executive level. And there's content for you, for everyone. Yeah. Well, that panel was all Sean, Shane. You asked great questions. Yeah. Tim and uh, Atul. I was just the good looks for yeah, it. Well, I wasn't going to say that, <laughs> but I was going to say you asked the right questions. <laughs> no, it was a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully people learn some things. And I think there's probably a replay somewhere out there. I think they're doing stuff around that. But uh, yeah, it was a good time. I'm happy to do that. It seems to be start to become my thing is moderating panels, which... If you'd asked me a year ago, like, uh, no way am I getting on stage. I'll talk in front of a microphone or a pod, you know, do a podcast, but you're an actual yes, stand up there. No, you're crazy. <laughs> so we all are working on something, but thank you very much. And you were in the back in your red jacket. You're yeah. very easy and to spot. You need a shout out. Yeah. And people are like, whoa, oh, I was going to send you a ovation for the jacket. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it was a good time. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up there. Andrew. John, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll have links in our show notes to FidoAlliance.org. Check out the great work, the UX uh, guidelines, all that stuff is out there. Uh, we're on the web, IDACpodcast.com. Yes, the YouTube link, youtube.com slash at IDAC podcast. Mastodon at InfoSec, I'm sorry, at IDAC, at InfoSec.exchange, and then Twitter, X, whatever it's called now. At IDAC podcast, or if people need like the easy ver easy button, yeah, go into your podcast app or go into YouTube and search for it. Then it's so yeah, man, like, subscribe, do a lot of fun stuff. We're starting to do video. This is our first conference with cameras and stuff like that. And thank yeah, you for people showing <laughs> up and, and actually watching how this madness, uh, you know, looks like behind the scenes, that kind of thing. So, with that, leave it there. Thanks everybody for watching and for listening. Thank you, Andrew, again. Okay. And we'll talk with everyone in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.